Welcome to Veronica Live, and I'm here with my wingman, John Salick, today. And we are joined by, you know, everybody loves attorneys. And we have an attorney, Ken Good from Texas. And, you know, your staffer reached out to me because you, I guess, are fighting uh, bond, bail bond reform. So, or bail, I'm sorry, bail reform. So we wanted to chat with you on that subject because, you know, research and getting ready for you to come on, this impacts everybody all over the country but differently depending on what state you belong to so welcome ken to veronica live well thank you so much for having me i'm i'm excited to be here and you're right i mean we're i'm just talking about what i call bad bell reform and we're seeing those across the country especially in our urban areas and and the people that live in our big cities are the ones that are getting hurt the most well, and, and let's talk about that because uh, some of the info that was sent my way talked about California and, uh, you know, there's zero bail. Uh, so if you're, I guess, arrested, you don't even have to put money up and then they let you out on the street. Uh, and then things don't always go well, you know, because you tend to re- re-offend. So is, is that not always the case when there's zero bail? No, I think we're seeing more and more data that that's what happens when you have these simple, we call, I call them simple release policies because they're called different things in different parts of the country. In uh, California, they have counties that call it zero bail. New York, they would call it release without bond. In Texas, they would recall it a release on a personal bond. But they're all the same thing. You're being released on just your promise that you will come back and answer your charges. And what we're finding is a large number of these people sometimes 80 percent, like in California misdemeanor courts or Houston, Texas, Harris County misdemeanor court, don't come back. And, you know, criminal cases are very uh, unique. If you're not there, they have to put your case on hold and they have to wait for you to return. And these simple release policies are creating chaos. Chaos creates de facto decriminalization and criminals see that as a green light to commit more crimes. Well, I, I saw a story this past week that 75% of crimes in, in um, several of the neighborhoods in New York City, because all of my, my people, my friends and family live in New York City, are created by these illegals. So they're arrested and then they're, they're you know, put out like the, in a couple hours and then they go and redo it again and, and they do it again and again. And so, so what do we have to do to change this? Because, you know, I'm frustrated by this. Well, what happened in New York is they enacted a list of crimes that if you are arrested and accused of those crimes, then the trial court has no discretion. The judge has to release you on no bail. So, you know, you get arrested, you go to jail, you get released quicker than the police can finish the report of what happened. And when you have these charge-based release mechanisms, you know, they're doing it. uh, They do it for one reason. They say, oh, well, we're protecting the poor. But when they do that, they're tying the hands of the judges so they can't address organized crime. They can't address gangs. They can't address career criminals. And now they can't even address people who are here in our country illegally who are committing crimes. And our criminal elements see that as, you know what, this is a green light. They can't do anything to me. I can commit these same crimes over and over and over again. And that's what we're seeing. Like in Houston, Texas, in misdemeanor court, you'll see people released. 16, 17, 18 times, uh, and then just get released again and again and again because we've taken away all the discretion from the trial court. So, so Ken, you know, as, as you know, you're familiar with the bail bond industry. It, is it what drove this? Was it was it the issue that we had all these these people sitting sitting in jail, you know, before their trial, they couldn't afford the the bail? Is is was that it, or is, is there some some other other issue going on here? Well, I, okay, I think this is a bigger issue than that. I think what we have is some activist groups that are seeing all this money that are be, is being spent on law enforcement, and they would like to redirect that money to uh, their causes, so more social-related causes. And they didn't think that the, the cities or the counties or, or the states were going to increase their budget. So I think it started out as a, 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 an argument against the bail industry as an easy target to then morph into criminal justice reform so that we could move those funds or some part of those funds over into social justice areas where they wanted the money to be spent. And all these things that we're seeing now 
as a result, crime increasing. So what's their response? Well, they're now just saying, oh, crime's not really increasing. It's just a perception issue. I mean, like, you know, when the NAACP in Oakland, California, is demanding a state of emergency on crime, it's hard to say that crime is not increasing. Well, in your uh, your staffer sent over um, research that New Jersey did on bail reform, and they said they found no evidence that eliminating cash bail increased violence and crime. And I, Ray, I, I got out my little flag, Ken, and I put, it says BS <laughs> on it, and I raised it really high because I didn't believe that for one minute, you know, and, and, and part of bail too. And then they seem to in there talk about, you know, well, poor people can't afford bail. But if your mother has to put a thousand dollars down, I think she's going to kick your ass when you're on bail. And I think then there's some accountability from family and friends, uh, you know. So, so in that that research that that your staffer sent over, it was it was a race issue, and these people don't have money, and it's not you know, what's the the word that we all use equitable to to charge somebody you know bail. But but I'm with you. I think they reoffend. Well, you know, that flies in the face of other data. There was a county in California, uh, Yolo County, where the DA just kept all the statistics during COVID. And, you know, COVID was a time period where we put a lot of these uh, simple release mechanisms and we tried them out, so, like on steroids, because we were scared of what was going to happen during COVID. So we have a lot of data from Yolo County. And Yolo County compared someone that was released on, you know, some simple bell mechanism versus somebody who was released on uh, the private industry bail system. And they found that uh, in comparison, somebody that was just simply released had a 200% greater chance of committing a violent offense, a new violent offense in the next 18 months compared to somebody who was released on the private surety bail system. And probably because the involvement of the family and the family is saying, okay, you've had your time. It's time for you to straighten up. And, and they were like, okay, if I don't straighten up, I'm really going to hurt my family. And I think that is a big indication of what's the difference between the two. But when you have a less than 10% failure to appear rate on the private industry and a 40%, 50%, or even 80% in some areas uh, on uh, these simple release mechanisms, I mean, there's not, it's not a comparison. These are not alternatives. And then you get to, okay, the New Jersey study that you've mentioned. And, And that's what we're finding We'll find these activist groups will then uh, form another group that will then do a study and say there's no difference. But if you look at that study, they're splitting hairs and they're really cha- you know, they're really arguing it's only one set of specific type of crime. It's not all crime. We're only going to talk about this one specific thing. And they didn't say it reduced. It. They just said we didn't find any uh, change. And so they're not arguing it's better. They're arguing that it's no change. And so they had to do all kinds of backflips just to get to no change. And I think they were looking at four different, you know, they they were talking about it had been in effect for like four years, but they only looked at two years. And I don't think any of that's an accident. I think we have a lot of one group that's an activist group who set up a subgroup that's doing a study. And then all the other activist groups rely upon that study to support what they want. And, And I think you have to look at the law enforcement uh, data to get true data of what's going on. So do you feel right. that George Soros is behind this because he's funded all these radical DAs? You know, he, he, he doesn't, you know, he wants pot to be legal. He doesn't seem to mind that people are released. Is it a George Soros driving this um, across the country to, to release all these, you know, supposedly petty criminals? Well, yes, of course. I mean, I think that's where I've discovered all these different subgroups. So when Soros backs you uh, in an election, then if you win, then you're invited to a seminar set up by, by one of his other groups that he's funded. And when you get there, they tell you, hey, this is a, a quid pro quo. We got you elected. And so here's what we expect from you. You're no longer going to seek enhancements on punishment. So if you arrest a drug dealer, you're uh, only going to seek uh, possession of drug charges. You're not going to do an enhancement for the all the drugs he was holding because he was a dealer. And that's a difference of two weeks in jail versus 20 years. And you know, and I know that a drug dealer would look at two weeks in jail as a cost of doing business. Oh yeah. And and, and it just goes the list goes on and on and on of what you will not do if you if if you are supported by them. 
and it, it's terrifying. And if you decide, hey, this goes too far, well, then you won't be invited back anymore because you're not progressive enough for them anymore. And there's a DA in Harris County that saw what that means. So she was a moderate DA, and so she had a well-funded Soros supporter who had three million, you know, two or three million dollars in the primary to defeat her. And now, you know, he's going on podcasts saying, well, you know, I just think Soros gets a bad rap. Bad rap. I think he's an okay dude. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, yeah, crime is going to go up like you've never seen in Houston, Texas, if this guy wins. Oh, gosh. So, so do, do you do you see the state to state differences in in bail laws as, as a as a national issue or or affecting the rate of crime? I, I know New York, you know, Governor Hoochel up there was was talking about maybe they need to go back and re-examine their bail law after after some really really outrageous incidents happen but i mean in florida you know we don't have that kind of stuff down here and it's not tolerated you know the sheriffs don't tolerate it our state attorneys don't tolerate it the governor doesn't tolerate it you know the legislature won't tolerate it I, i'm just curious is that is that driving criminals more towards the easy targets in the big cities Yes, I do believe that. I mean, we have a really good example in Harris County of some people who were arrested, and as they were driving to the jail, they're like, this isn't the way to the Harris County jail. And they're like, <laughs> well, no, because you cross the county, and you're in Montgomery County, the next county, and we prosecute criminals. And so they were really upset that they crossed the county line and because the, you know they were being told Montgomery County will prosecute criminals, and we – we don't care if it's a misdemeanor. We're going to prosecute you. So I do think that it is being the jurisdiction, the geography is 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 guiding this, and I think it's all politics. I mean, somehow, some way, politics more than normal has has just taken over this area of the law. And, you know, if you live in one geographic area, the argument's going to be, well, uh, we have too many minorities in the jail, and it's a systemic racism problem. Yeah. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of data that addresses that. There's a whole bunch of data that says that's not true. But if you even say that, you're considered a racist. I mean, you could look to the Minnesota data that's just a couple of years old where they tracked the race of the people uh, alleging the crime. So the people reporting it and the people who were accused of, of, of committing the crime, they took it all the way through the criminal justice system. And they found that there was a disproportionate amount of crime being uh, committed by certain racial groups, but when they got into the criminal justice system, they were treated better than other racial groups. And so, you know, it's hard. I mean, it's a great political argument. It's a great argument to get people out to vote for you. It's a great reason to make people mad. But the problem is when you look at the substance of their arguments and you say, well, what if we're wrong? Well, then the people that are getting hurt the most are those same racial groups, because like murders. 50% of all murders in the United States are committed by young black, are, are committed on young black males, and by and large, the, the person committing the crime is young black males as well. And so, because we commit right, we commit crimes within our our neighborhoods, and we by and large live within our racial groups, uh, with some exceptions. And so, I mean, the people who are getting hurt the most in our inner, city, inner cities are the very people that these activists say they're trying to help. Well, um, it really, really amazes me because that's, you know, that you see that same argument in the education system, you know, where where these these inner city schools with the blacks, which are, which are typically run by 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 black mayors and and superintendents and city councils and everything. And, and they're 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 horrendous. They're the worst education. But who are they damaging? They're damaging the minority kids and, and they don't yes, seem to care. And, you know, you know, well, you know, let, let me tell you what data they're relying upon. They're relying upon people who fail or drop out of school have a higher percentage chance of going to prison. And so their response to that is we're going to pass everybody and we're going to dumb down the whole class. I mean, you've got inner city schools that can't pass. I mean, they're two grades behind on reading or math or, or they're just way off level. And I mean, we're now at the level where we're just passing everybody and they're doing it. With the, with the, uh, I think with those studies saying, well, if we don't, they have a greater chance of going to, to prison. But we are dumbing down the whole class, and so no one will be able to be successful because of of these steps that they're taking uh, that I think are very misguided. 
So, did you laugh when Newsom came out last week and now, you know, he, it's on his website, it, it says stronger enforcement, serious penalties, real consequences. So, if you if you damage or destroy like $50,000 worth of something, they're going to take retail theft seriously, which I'm like, okay, one Gucci <laughs> purse, you still get out of jail. So, so, I thought the whole thing was a joke. It should have been like, you know, a 5K offense and then you're in trouble. Trouble. So, do you, so do you laugh when you see something like that? I mean, I was laughing because I was like, "Why is he? You know, he's trying well, to you know, make you would himself laugh look good." You would, you would laugh if California wasn't so sad. I mean, if it wasn't an election cycle right. going on where Kamala Harris was the vice was the presidential nominee and she's from California, you wouldn't even have this. I mean, remember, California was the state that enacted Proposition Forty Seven which changed certain felonies to misdemeanors. And they argued, hey, this is going to, we're still going to have to answer for their crimes, but this will allow them to get jobs. Well, one of those crimes was theft under $950. And then after it passed, then the urban cities, the DA said, well, we're no longer going to prosecute theft under $950. And so then you started having $25,000 a day in shoplifting. And, you know, stores can't withstand $25,000 a day in shoplifting. And you've got all these major brands that are closing stores. And so his, his, little, his little thing that he's doing there isn't addressing what's the, the heart of the problem, which is these DAs are no longer going to prosecute those crimes. And so now you have another proposition that's on the ballot in November to not completely repeal the Proposition 47, but to make major revisions to it. And it'll be interesting to see what these DAs will do. I mean, they're starting to lose elections. In fact, Gascon in L.A. County only got 25 percent of the ballot in the primary, but he still made it to the final round. But I just don't see any way he can win. And I don't see any way the the prop uh, prop prop 47 doesn't get repealed. That's the shorthand word for it or majorly revised as a result of the new proposition that's going to be on the ballot in November. And, and, you know, I mean, what really scares me is this original prop 47 was entitled the Safe Schools Act. I mean, everything they're doing in California, they say, is to make us safer. But if it's going to release criminals from prison, it's not going to make you safer. I mean, even the Supreme Court recognized this years and years ago, releasing the uh, the equivalent of a brigade of criminals from prison is only going to do one thing. It's going to increase crime. And that's what it's done. So I have a question because, you know, Trump says we could have anywhere from 10 to 20 million illegals in here and and i've heard that prisons are full of illegals it, it, are they part of the problem if we had a secure bo- border and didn't have millions upon millions of people um that we don't know who you know are here they're saying that many are released from prisons from venezuela you know or south america wherever are they part of what makes this whole thing worse ken Absolutely. And you really the uh, policy on immigration and the policy on criminal justice reform are so similar. It's it's ridiculous. I mean, the government is is really ignoring both issues. And, you know, if, if a couple of years ago, if you even questioned their policy, you would be attacked as being racist. And now we're seeing the impact of it across the country where we're we're finding out all these things that are being done by the government to house people. But, you know, we already have old uh, laws on the books that say they can't work. So what can they do? They come to the United States illegally. They can't work. And so what are they going to do? I mean, they're either going to live on government benefits, which usually are not enough to live on, uh, because there's supposed to be something between your situ- getting your old situation to a new situation. And so you end up uh, – is it a big shock that these pe- people end up committing crime? I mean, of course not. And the problem is we're being taught that we can't – hold people accountable anymore. I mean, that's the real big problem in, in the criminal justice reform. We've ended accountability. And when when we do that, when criminals see that, hey, there's no consequences to what happens when, when our illegal immigrants come to the country and see there's no consequences for them doing I- uh, illegal activities when they come to the country, that's perceived as just a green light to do more and more of the same. Uh, one of the ways I describe it is, you know, in our inner cities, we have a city within our city because we have, by and large, a large amount of the crime is being committed by the same numbers of people, same groups of people. But between the two cities, there's this gray area of people that are watching both cities to decide what they're going to do on any given day. And right now in our urban cities, we're in this period where the city within the city is just uh, making millions of dollars. Organized crime is making millions of dollars on these 
on these crimes that are no longer being, uh, you know, enforced or they're not going to charge or they're not going to prosecute or they're just they're just finding ways to make money hand over fist. And the people that live in the gray area between the two cities are seeing that. And that's the reason why we're seeing crime go up, because there's when there's no consequences, of course, that's going to increase crime. So, well, so Ken, what, what's what's the end game here? I mean, right. you know, it's you, you know, I understand. You know, to me, I, I don't live in a big city, right? So I was like, well, if, you know, if they want to, you know, become the jungle and and prey on each other and all this kind of stuff, and that's that's what the politicians want, and that's what the people vote in, because that, that is the end end of the day. You know, it's the voters that have a say in it, and they vote these people in. It's like, okay, if they want to live that way, then then fine. And, and you notice that it never. Until the crime crosses into the the high end part of the cities, you know, then then it's a little bit different tune. But what what's the end game here? But by, by these politicians doing this? Well, okay. So what's the end game? I think the end game is just uh, getting more uh, people to come out for elections. I mean, you can track this back three or four or five election cycles, uh, six months before an election, there would be some uh, public event some public tragedy that took place. And so you have all these protests and you would have all these politicians come out and saying, you minority group have been, you are being mistreated. You need to get angry and you need to come out and vote in larger numbers. And it has by and large worked, but we're now getting to the point where, uh, you know, once you create a mob, it's hard to control the mob. And uh, I, I don't, I mean, I, I am hopeful on the, in where we're going with this, because what we're doing is not sustainable. I mean, the uh, inner cities, what we have going, I mean, you've got politicians that are now in denial mode. I mean, look at the national politics. Everybody is trying to look like they're law and order. Look at, you just mentioned Newsom's website. So they're oh very my gosh, right? <laughs> of, of coming out. So, so we're now in this period of time where they have to deny that they're not in favor of law and order, even though their past actions have shown that they're not. They're not willing to do anything to change it. And there's a whole big story on this uh, current proposition and the way they tried to, to uh, uh, de- defeat it by the back door, which they ended up dropping. And so, I mean, I mean, we've got all kinds of skull do- skullduggery going on right now. But we've been through this before. We went through the same cycle in the 60s where we felt safe. We were more forgiving on our criminal laws. Crime started going up. And we started having this debate about what to do about it. And one side of the, poli- the political spectrum refused to get involved, refused to participate. And we ended up with, you know, Reagan and the war on crime. And, and you, it just seems like in many ways we're repeating the same mistakes that we repeated more, uh, that, we pre- re- that we committed in the 60s. This time we're, committing them on a, uh, we're doing them on a larger scale because you've got the Soros money pushing even further to the left. And so when we have that final backlash, and the push to the right, it will go further to the right than it went last time. So, but in many ways, we're committing the same, we're doing the same cycle we've already been through in the 60s. So do you think, uh, final question here, that Trump's going to take it? I, I really think Americans want it back. Mm. Our, our, I mean, we want criminals in jail. You know, I think of that, the college girl that was killed in Georgia, the illegal had been arrested, I think five times in New York, you know, all of, all of these, the 12 year old that was um, murdered and raped in Texas, like as a mother, I, like, I can't take it anymore as an American. I can't take it anymore. I I'm tired of Americans being preyed on, you know, are we, are we going to, is Trump going to win so we can get this back? I, I think I think we would have won this two election cycles ago, so four years ago when Trump was running for re-election. But for this abortion issue, uh, the, you know, the Democrats have yet to lose the abortion issue. And I think there's like nine states that have abortion issues on the ballot, which will right. bring out voters. I don't think any of those states are battleground states, but maybe one. Uh, and so I, I am concerned, uh, especially with what's going on in the media where – the media is is kind of assisting with uh, one candidate, so she doesn't have to address the issues. I, it, yeah. It's like they, when they decided it was her, they knew her shortcomings. They knew that anytime she talks about the issues, the public will not like her. So they made this decision that they're not going to, uh, they're just going to get on board with a conspiracy, not to make her take tough positions, and and it's just gotten worse and worse. And so uh, there's a new story out where. 
some whistleblowers came out on ABC talking about all the things they did before the debate, and they signed an affidavit before the uh, before the debate saying all these things that ultimately happened. That the debate, the ABC agreed not to fact check her during the debate. They only fact checked Trump. There was a list of questions they could not ask, or she would not participate. And then they unmuted the microphones, even though there was an agreement that they would right. be. So, I mean, it just started to look like there's this conspiracy. And my favorite, but I'll tell you, my favorite thing. There's two things. There was an uh, an article that said the press declared uh, uh, Kamala the winner of the debate, and then the the uh, public. Uh, responded. And so it's, the comparison was the critics on Rotten Tomatoes versus audience responses on, <laughs> on Rotten Tomatoes. And, and then um, on X, uh, Elon Musk did a poll uh, for, for either Harris or Trump, and he just announced that yesterday, and it was 75% Trump, 25% Harris. So I, I just don't know. Every time I say the polls are wrong, the polls turn out to be right. But I think this is we've been through a cycle in the last month where it was more of a push poll that you see during the primaries to try to push the public to where you want them to be. We're now past that stage and we're in the election cycle. I expect Trump to firm. Well, I'm hopeful that Trump will firm up, but I'm concerned. I mean, I'm not trying to make light of this, but there's still 60 days. How many more attempts? To, to kill Trump can take place during that time. We've I'm, already had two. Yes, petrified. Well, Ken, we've got to have you back. Um, we've been talking with attorney Ken W. Good, and he is, you know, trying to fight on bail reform because I think we need we need that, and it needs to be the same across all the states, and we got to keep the bad guys in prison. Um, Ken, we'll have you back on Veronica Live because so much, you know, more to talk about. It's been a pleasure having you on today. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining Veronica Live.